Today I want to reflect with you about when courage fails. I know that sometimes at the key moments of my life, I haven't been very brave. My courage fails me. I remember being in a neonatal intensive care unit for months on end when our babies were little, and I did not feel like a big, strong, brave Christian. I felt like I had almost no faith at all, like I could barely pray. A few weeks ago, when the coronavirus epidemic became more serious and it began to spread throughout the United States, I found myself having a hard time sleeping. I was not feeling brave and courageous and secure. I was wondering, what's going to happen? What is going to befall all of us? What might happen to me? What might happen to the people I care about? And my courage was very low. I find that of myself, I'm not a particularly brave or strong person. What happens when our courage fails? Why does our courage fail? How can we uh, be delivered from that? When it's Palm Sunday and you're surrounded by crowds singing Jesus' praises and you're all excited and feeling great about what the future holds, then you feel like you can do just about anything. When, on the other hand, things look dangerous, then comes the test of courage. That's what happened with Peter and with his fellow disciples. You will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Jesus is saying this on the Thursday evening, a few hours before he would be arrested. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Peter has declared that he will die for Jesus, but he can't even stay awake for Jesus. Once more he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough! The hour has come. Look! The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. Then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Another of the Gospels tells us that the one who drew the sword and struck the ear of the high priest, uh, the high priest's servant, was Peter himself. Peter was willing to kill for Jesus, but not so willing to die for Jesus. Am I leading a rebellion, said Jesus, that you come out with swords and clubs to capture me? 
Every day I was with you, teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then everyone deserted him and fled. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following him. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. Well, the picture doesn't show the young man fleeing naked, but all of Jesus' disciples fled, all his followers fled, and it's often thought that the young man who fled naked was the author of this gospel, John Mark, making his only cameo appearance. That's one of the signs, by the way, of the truthfulness of the Bible. If you were writing about your own behavior um, when you're telling the story of Jesus, would you tell the worst parts about yourself? But here's John Mark fleeing away. Here is Peter. Here are all the other disciples fleeing away after they all said they would stand with Jesus and even die for him. But they all run away, and they later on record their complete failure to stand with their Lord. That's one of the signs of the truthfulness of the Bible. The very people who wrote it didn't gloss over their own failings. And by the way, the Gospel of Mark, according to the early historians of the church, was written by Mark, but written mostly by taking stories told to him by the Apostle Peter and then writing down what Peter had told him. Peter followed Jesus at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You also were with that Nazarene, Jesus, she said. But he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said, and went out into the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, This fellow is one of them. Again, he denied it. So again, big, brave Peter is not willing to say that he's follower of Jesus in the presence of a servant girl. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. He began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. Immediately the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. Peter's courage failed. And with that second crowing of the rooster, he remembered what Jesus had said, and he knew the depth and horror of his failure, and the tears began to flow. If your courage is at a low ebb, it might help to look at what happened when Peter's courage failed. And first of all, we just need to understand what was going on with Peter and what brought this about. When your courage fails, there can be a number of factors at work, and here are some of the things that were involved with Peter's failure. First of all, Peter disagreed with Jesus. When you disagree with Jesus, I can guarantee you that you are on the road to failure. Jesus told Peter that all the disciples would flee away, and Peter disagreed. And this wasn't the first time that Peter disagreed with Jesus. Peter was a person who would blurt whatever was on his mind. Earlier, when he was first getting to know Jesus and just beginning to get acquainted with him, Peter was out fishing, and Jesus gave him a fishing tip. Peter had been fishing all night and had caught nothing. So Jesus said, well, try throwing the net on the other side of the boat. And Peter said, I'm a fisherman. We've been fishing all night. But because you say so, and he threw the net on the other side of the boat, and a, whoo, a whole pile of fish came, and they could hardly drag the net back into the boat, and it was so many fish that it almost sank the boat. And when that happened, Peter changed his mind and fell at Jesus' feet and said, Depart from me, Lord, I'm, I'm a sinful man. He had disagreed with Jesus, and then suddenly he realized whose presence he was in. 
Later on, Peter made a great confession. Jesus asked, who do people say that I am? And it turned out, said the disciples, there's a variety of answers. And then Jesus said, what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon. And he renamed him Peter, the rock. And he said, God has revealed this to you. But right after that great moment where Peter made this confession about Jesus as the son of God, Jesus said, now the son of man is going to be betrayed and he's going to suffer and die. And Peter's response was, never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. He disagreed with Jesus again. He said that Jesus should not go the way of the cross. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. Then when they were together as disciples with Jesus in the upper room, Jesus uh, took off his outer cloak, grabbed a towel, and began washing the feet of the disciples. None of the disciples wanted that disagreeable job, and so Jesus himself did it and began washing their feet. And then he got to Peter, and Peter said, Never, Lord, you shall never wash my feet. Again, he disagreed with Jesus. And Jesus said, Well, if I don't wash you, you have no part in me. And then Peter says, Oh, not just my feet, but wash me all over. And Jesus said, No, you're already clean because of the words I've spoken to you. We just need your feet washed. So, again and again, Peter's walking with Jesus, learning from Jesus, but he's also disagreeing with Jesus. Do you ever have that in your own life? Where you read a statement of Jesus in the Bible, or you know something that he's calling you to do, or some truth that he's calling you to believe, and you say, well, I don't see how that can be true. I don't see how I can do that particular thing you want me to do. I can't see why you would do that, God. And you find yourself in disagreement with Jesus. Well, just remember, when Jesus spoke to Peter and said, you're going to flee, Peter disagreed. I won't. And Jesus said, you know, will not only flee, you'll deny me three times. And Peter said, no, I won't. Who turned out to be right? When you disagree with Jesus, I will guarantee you who is going to turn out to be right. It's going to be Jesus. And so if you want courage, the first thing you need to do is get yourself aligned with the Lord Jesus Christ and face the fact that if you're out of line with him or disagreeing with him, He's the one who's going to be right, and you need to learn the truth. Another reason Peter's courage failed was he overestimated himself. That's a great danger. When you overestimate yourself, you're putting yourself in a position to fail and your courage to fall apart. Peter said, even if everybody else would flee away. I will never flee away. I'm willing to go to prison. I'm willing to die for you. I am a person of courage. I am so devoted to you, Jesus. Ever had that? Where you were feeling pretty good about yourself. Oh, you had had a wonderful experience from God. You'd been worshiping with his people. You'd felt really close to Jesus and you said, this is me. This is the way it's always going to be. I am such a Christian. I'm such a believer. I'm on fire for the Lord. I can do anything. Really? Really? When you're in the Palm Sunday crowd and a whole crowd seems to be celebrating, you might feel really strong. When you're in the upper room with Jesus, and he's speaking to you of his deepest secrets and pouring out his far heart to the Father in prayer, then you may feel very strong and very close to him. But there will come a time when your setting changes and you will find out that you overestimated yourself if you think that you're as strong as you felt during those spiritual highs. Don't, under, don't overestimate yourself. And don't underestimate Satan. We know from another of the Gospels that Jesus' warning to Peter was not just that he would fail, but that Satan wanted him. He said to Peter, Satan wants to sift all of you like wheat. Satan wants you, Peter. He wants all of you disciples. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned, then strengthen your brothers. Well, 
Jesus gave the warning. He said, Satan wants you. And what does Peter say? I'll never deny you. I will be able to do it. But he underestimated the power of the great dragon, that ancient serpent, the devil, that one whom Jesus called the strong man, whom only Jesus could bind. Peter thinks that he's ready to take on the whole world. He's ready to take on all the powers of darkness. He's ready to overcome Satan himself. Hey, Peter had been out there on preaching missions. He had been able to drive out demons in Jesus' name. Why shouldn't he be able to win and be triumphant? But he disagreed with Jesus. He overestimated himself and he underestimated Satan. There was another incident in Jesus' ministry where even after the disciples had been driving out demons, they ran into one they couldn't handle. And Jesus said, this kind comes, only, comes out only by prayer. Even among the demons, there's different levels of power. And if you're going to take on the prince of darkness himself and think that you've got it in yourself to overcome him, you are in for a sad shock. And that's what happened to Peter. He underestimated the power of the prince of darkness. He learned that lesson, and later on, he warned um, people who were reading his letter that they needed to be on watch because the devil goes around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. That's what Peter said then, having learned that the devil is not somebody to take lightly, but is more like a roaring lion or a great dragon. So know what you're up against. You also are bound to fail if you fail to watch and pray. We want to be strong in that moment when we're tested, when we're asked to lay down our life, to be heroic and courageous in the face of death, to look death right in the eye and be unafraid. You don't get to that point of courage by snoozing. You deny Jesus three times when three times you snoozed when you were supposed to be praying. That's what happened to Peter. You cannot just neglect your prayer life and neglect your watchfulness. When you fail to watch and pray, you will fall in the time of temptation. So think about your own life. Are you alert? Are you praying? How is your prayer life? During these times when we've been confined more to our homes, many of us, have you taken the extra time and spent the extra focus to watch and pray, watching for the Lord's hand, watching for the hand of the tempter, being aware of the various strategies of the devil, and becoming more and more a person of prayer? This is a time to grow as a person of prayer. You also fail when you use the wrong weapon and find out that that's not the weapon for the situation. When Jesus is about to be arrested, Peter is brave in that moment. He whips out his sword. He's ready to take on the mob. He slices off the ear of the high priest's servant. And it's the wrong weapon. Jesus says, put your sword away. And then according to the Gospel of Luke, he touches the ear of the wounded man and heals that ear. Jesus doesn't want us winning with the weaponry of this world, with the swords and the clubs. Jesus says, hey, I could call on my father and he could send 12 legions of angels to rescue me, but that's not what God's plan is. And once Peter finds out that his sword and his willingness to kill are not what the moment demands, he turns and flees because he's ready to kill for Jesus, not so ready to die for him. He's ready to battle the enemies with all his energy, but he's not ready to himself suffer at the hands of the enemy. Another problem, of course, in the failure of Peter's courage is that he lost his focus on Jesus. He was not handling the situation in solidarity with Jesus by standing with Jesus, by conducting himself calmly the way that Jesus did. This isn't the first time that happened either. You remember the story of Jesus walking on the water? And as he comes toward the boat, the disciples are terrified to see him walking on the water, and they think it's a ghost. And Jesus says, don't be afraid, it's I. And then Peter says, well, Lord, I want to come walking to you on the water. And Jesus invites him to get out of the boat and walk on the water, and Peter does it. He gets out of the boat. That's how bold Peter is. 
and he's walking on that water. And then he notices where he really is. He notices the waves. He notices the storm and the wind. And he loses his focus on Jesus. And the moment that happens, whoosh, down he goes into the lake. And then he cries out, Lord, save me. And Jesus does. But Peter's failure was when he started looking more at the danger than at the Savior. And I know that's what happens with me. When I start thinking about, oh, the deadly virus. When I think about, oh, how am I going to go on with life? What will happen if people whom I love die? When I was a father of young babies, wondering what would happen to a little one, would I be able to handle that? The answer is no, I can't handle that. But when I'm looking at what I can handle or can't handle, I'm not looking so much at Jesus anymore. And so it's okay to look at some of the challenges and to be aware of what they are, perhaps, but we need to stay focused on Jesus because if we don't, our courage fails. Another time courage fails is when you need crowd approval. Palm Sunday, the crowd is positive. The crowd is shouting Jesus' praises. But by Friday morning, and even by Thursday night already, it's a different crowd. Uh, there's different crowds. And when you're in with one crowd of people who share your faith, who are excited about Jesus, hey, it's easy to say, I'm going to be brave and bold. When you're surrounded by those people in the night with their swords and clubs, or when you're out there on Friday morning and a different crowd has gathered than the one that loved Jesus, and that crowd is yelling for his crucifixion, then it's not so easy to be a follower of Jesus anymore. I know more than one person who thought they were a devout Christian till they moved away from home and they got a different crowd. And different people were not so impressed by Jesus. They weren't so impressed by those who would believe in Jesus. And some found that when they changed their situation and their environment and the crowd they were with, they also lost the faith that they thought they had. Courage fails. So when you disagree with Jesus or overestimate yourself or underestimate Satan or fail to pray, when you use the wrong weapons, when you see danger but not Jesus, and when you're just counting on the people around you, that's when courage fails. And so we need to learn from Peter's failure. Peter didn't just tell us this story, and Mark didn't just write it down so that we could say, yeah, Peter, what a loser. Um, we were instead meant to learn from it. Yeah, this, this Peter, who was very bold in many ways, a greater man than we in so many respects, he failed. If he failed, so will we, especially if we make the mistakes that he made. And when that time of failure comes, then what? Well, what did Peter do? He broke down and wept. But Peter was not lost. Because remember what Jesus had said? Jesus had said all along, Satan has asked to have you, but I have prayed for you, and when you turn again, strengthen your brothers. He didn't say if, he said when. Because Jesus was looking out for Peter, even in that moment of worst failure. And Jesus turned and looked at Peter right after he denied him the third time. Jesus happened to be right there, and he looked Peter right in the eye. And Peter saw that look, and he heard that rooster, and he knew that he had failed his master totally. But when you fail your master totally, he does not fail you. You said you would die for him, but he dies for you. That's the gospel story. Peter's experience in a nutshell. If it depended on Peter, all is lost. But it depends on Jesus Christ. How does Jesus restore Peter? How does Jesus himself stand in the face of the trial? Well, Peter, unlike Peter, who was brave and thought he was going to stand strong, Jesus was terrified. Jesus said, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He was sweating blood even before he faced that ordeal. But he faced it in all its horror, 
and he overcame it. He prayed, and when he prayed repeatedly to the Father, the Father sent an angel not to rescue him from the ordeal, but to strengthen him and to help him to stand strong again and be ready to meet his betrayer and those who were there to arrest him. Jesus prayed that he himself would be strengthened and his Father gave him the strength to go forward. And he prayed for Peter. He prayed for the other disciples. And because he prayed for them, they were not lost forever. Because he prayed for them, they were restored to faith. And we need to face who's the hero in all of this. It surely wasn't Peter. And it surely isn't you or I. All alone. Abandoned by all his closest followers. Abandoned by the twelve. Abandoned by the three who were closest to him, abandoned by the one, Peter, who was the spokesman for the apostles, all alone, Jesus defeated sin. All alone, Jesus defeated death. All alone, Jesus defeated Satan. Jesus did everything himself that the rest of humanity failed to do. From Adam all the way through Peter, humanity has blown it again and again and again. And then there was one, there was one who all alone destroyed the power of sin and death and Satan. When you think of salvation, don't take even 1% of the credit for yourself. It was Jesus 100%. He absorbed our evil. He absorbed the evil of Peter's denial of abandonment by the other disciples. He abandoned all the sins of the whole. He absorbed all the sins of the whole world. He absorbed our evil, took it into his body, and paid the penalty and suffered for that sin on the cross. And having done all that for us, there is still something that happened in us and that needs to happen. Jesus pays for our failure. He succeeds where we fail. But he still makes us face our failure, and he moves us to repent. He did that with Peter. He warned him ahead of time that it was coming. After Peter had blown it, Jesus looked him straight in the eye, and the rooster crowed. And in that moment, Peter knew that he had failed. And then later on, after Jesus' resurrection, he came to Peter. And Peter three times had failed to pray. Peter three times had denied Jesus, and he had to repent of that and get on a different path. So Jesus, three times, after Peter three times slept and three times denied, Jesus three times asked Peter, Do you love me? And Peter replied the first time, I love you. You know that I love you. And when Jesus asked again the third time, the Bible says Peter was grieved that Jesus asked that third time, do you love me? But he had denied him three times. And so he was asked three times to state again his love. And then Jesus said, feed my lambs. So there's a big difference. We're looking at Peter and his failure. If you fast forward, less than two months later, Peter is preaching the gospel in power and thousands are being converted and he's preaching to many of the very crowd who had crucified Jesus. What happened? Well, the main thing that happened, of course, was that Jesus rose again from the dead and had conquered death. And then Jesus poured out his Holy Spirit on Peter and Peter was filled with that spirit and filled with the mighty boldness of the living God. And that's what made the difference in Peter's life. And that's what makes the difference for you and me. On this Holy Week, when we remember the failure of humanity and how Jesus had to do it all alone, let us also remember what comes after, the glorious resurrection of Jesus, the outpouring of his Holy Spirit in our hearts, and what he did with Peter. When Jesus called Peter to be his follower, it's not as though he didn't know Peter and didn't know his weaknesses and faults and failings. And when Peter disagreed with Jesus, when Peter blew it here and there, it's not as though Jesus said, oh, I didn't realize that. Okay, I got no use for you. Even midway through his ministry, Jesus said, you are Peter the rock, and I'm going to build my church on rock. Well, Peter (laughs) didn't look very rock-like. He looked like he was just all over the place um, and very weak 
and very wishy-washy. But Mr. Wishy-washy turned out to be rocky after all because Jesus had called him the rock. And when Jesus calls you by a name, that name becomes your reality. Jesus had called Peter and said, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. And he said, feed my lambs. He gave Peter that high calling to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. And when God gives you a name, that is who you are. When God gives you a calling, that is what you accomplish. And Peter went on to be a mighty apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, spreading the gospel. And when the time finally came for his journey on earth to be done, he was crucified himself. He asked to be crucified upside down so that he wouldn't die in the exact same manner as Jesus because he said he wasn't worthy to die in the same way that Jesus died. That's the kind of courage that Peter had once he was filled with the Holy Spirit, believing in the resurrection and established in his calling by the Lord Jesus Christ. When your courage fails, it's helpful to think about why and to avoid the pitfalls and traps. But above all, return to Jesus. Focus on Jesus and think about how he restores, how he worked salvation all alone, how it is even he who moves you to hear that rooster, to see his eyes looking at you, and to know the depth of your failure. It is he who gives you those tears. And then out of those tears comes the new life, the faith in the risen Lord, and the power of the Holy Spirit. Dear friend, if, if you're struggling right now with a feeling that you're weak, you're wimpy, you're afraid, hey, Jesus himself felt terror. He's been through everything we've been through and yet was without sin. Jesus is the one who can strengthen you in the face of trial. Jesus is the one even who, when you fall, can lift you up, set you on your feet, and make you who you're meant to be.